of Phoebus and Eurydice. The story of Phoebus and Eurydice is the ultimate tragic love story. Perhaps one of the most famous Greek myths, it has inspired many important painters such as Peter Paul Rubens and Nicolas Poussin. Moreover, many operas, songs and plays have been composed to honor these two great lovers who tragically lost the change to enjoy their love. The story of Ophias and Eurydice has been told in many versions with a few differences between them. The earliest account comes from Ibicus, a Greek lyric poet. Hereby we present you a mixture of these various versions. Ophias is known as the most talented music player of the ancient times. It is said that God Apollo was his father, from whom took his extreme talent in music and the muse Calliope was his mother. He was living on Thrace, on the northeastern part of Greece. Aphias had a divinely gifted voice that could charm everyone who heard it. When he was presented first the lyre as a boy, he had it mastered in no time at all. The myth says that no god or mortal could resist his music, and even the rocks and trees would move themselves to be near him. According to some ancient texts, Aphias is accredited to have taught agriculture, writing and medicine to the mankind. He is also attributed with having been an astrologer, a seer and founder of many mystic rites. The strange and aesthetic music of Aphias would intrigue the mind of people to sense our natural and had the power to broaden the mind to new unusual theories. However, Apart from a musical talent, Ophias also had an adventurous character. He was believed to have taken part in the Agronautic Expedition, which is a voyage of Jason and his fellow agronauts to get the cultures and steal the Golden Fleece. In fact, Ophias played a wider role during the expedition because, playing his music, he put to sleep the sleepless dragon that was guarding the Golden Fleece and thus Jason managed to get the fleece. Moreover, the music of Ophia saved the agronauts from the sirens, the strange female-like creatures, who were seducing men with their nice voice and then they were killing them. Ophias used to spend much of his early years in the idyllic pursuits of music and poetry. His skill had far surpassed the fame and respect of his music. Humans and beasts alike would be enchanted by it, and often even the most inanimate of objects would earn to be near him. Well into his years and had mastered the lyre and his melodious voice garnered him audiences from near and afar. It was at one such gathering of humans and beasts that his eyes fell on wood nymph. The girl was called Eurydice. She was beautiful and shy. She had been drawn to Ophias, enamored by his voice, and such was the spell of beauty in music and appearance that neither could cast their eyes off each other. Something inexplicable tugged the hearts of two young people, and soon they fell dearly in love, unable to spend a single moment apart. After a while, they dedicated to get married. Their wedding day dawned bright and clear. Hymenaeus, the god of marriage, blessed their marriage and then a great feast followed. The surroundings were filled with laughter and gaiety. Soon the shadows grew large, signaling an end to their rivalry that had lasted much of the day and the wedding guests all took leave of the new olivets, who were still sitting hand in hand and starry-eyed. They soon both realized that it was time they were on their way and departed for home. However, things would soon change and grief would ensue happiness. There was one man who was despising Orpheus and desired Eurydice for his own. Aristeas, a shepherd, had plotted a plan to conquer the beautiful nymph, and there he was, waiting in the bushes for the young couple to pass by. Seeing that the lovers were approaching, he intended to jump on them and kill Ophias, 
As the shepherd made his move, Aphias grabbed Eurydice by the hand and started running pell-mell through the forest. The chase was long and Aristeas showed no signs of giving up or slowing down. On and on they ran and suddenly Aphias felt Eurydice stumble and fall, her hand slipping from his grasp. Unable to comprehend what had just happened, he rushed to her side but stopped short in dismay. For his eyes perceived the deathly pallor that suffused her cheeks. Looking around, he saw no trace of the shepherd for Aristeas had witnessed the event and had left. Few steps away, Eurydice had stepped on the nest of snakes and had been bitten by a deadly viper. Knowing that there was no change of survival, Aristeas had debounded his try, cursing his luck and the fears. After the death of his beloved wife, Aphias was no more the same carefree person he used to be. His life without Eurydice seemed endless and could do nothing more than grieve for her. This is when he had a great but yet crazy idea. He decided to go to Underworld and try to get his wife back. Apollo, his father, would talk to Hades, the god of the Underworld, to accept him and hear his plea. Armed with his weapons, the lyre and voice, Aphias approached Hades and demanded him try into the underworld. None challenged him. Standing in front of the rulers of the dead, Aphias said why he was there, and in a voice both mellifluous and disquieting. He played his lyre and sent out to King Hades and Queen Persephone that Eurydice was returned to him. Not even the most stone-hearted of people or gods could have neglected the heart in his voice. Hades openly wept. Persephone's heart melted and even Cerberus, the gigantic three-headed hound, guarding the entrance to the underworld, covered his many ears with the bows and howled in despair. The voice of Aphias was so moving that Hades promised to this desperate man that Eurydice would follow him to the upper world, the world of the living. However, he warned Aphias that for no reason must he look back while his wife was still in the dark, or that would undo everything he hoped for. He should wait for Eurydice to get into the light before he looked at her. With great faith in his heart and joined his son, Aphias began his journey out of the underworld, joyful that he would once again be reunited with his love. As Aphias was reaching the exit of the underworld, he could hear the footfalls of his wife approaching him. He wanted to turn around and hug her immediately, but managed to control his feelings. As he was approaching the exit, his heart was beating faster and faster. The moment he stepped on the world of the living, he turned his head to hug his wife. Unfortunately, he got only a glimpse of Eurydice before she was once again drawn back into the underworld. When Aphias turned his head, Eurydice was still in the dark, she hadn't seen the sun and, as Hades had warned Aphias, his sweet wife was drawn back to the dark world of the dead. Waves of anguish and despair swept over him and, shuddering with grief, he approached the underworld again, but this time he was denied and tried. The gates were standing shut and God Hermes, sent by Zeus, wouldn't let him in. From then on, the heartbroken musician was wandering disoriented, day after day, night after night, in total despair. He could find no consolation in anything. His misfortune tormented him, forcing him to abstain from contact with any other woman and slowly but surely he found himself shunning their company completely. His sons were no more joyful but extremely sad. His only comfort was to lay on a huge rock and feel the cares of the breeze. His only vision were the open skies. And so it was that a group of erite women, furious for his scorn towards them, chanced upon him. Aphias was so desperate that he did not even try to repulse their advances. 
the women killed him, cut his body into pieces and threw them and his lyre into a river. It is said that his head and his lyre floated down river to the island of Lesbos. There the muses found them and gave Orpheus a proper burial ceremony. People believed that his grave emanated music plenty yet beautiful. His soul descended down to Hades, where he was finally reunited with his beloved Eurydice.